joining us today on Around the Peninsula. I'm Maria Sorreo. We are here today at the PV Golf Club where you will have the unique opportunity to hear from all four mayors on the Hill. Now this event is sponsored by the Palos Verdes Peninsula Chamber of Commerce. So let's catch up with the CEO of the Chamber, Ms. Eileen Hupp. You know, doing this event has been actually a dream of mine for several years, and it's something that we finally be able to be able to bring to fruition. And I couldn't be more excited at the great response we've had from our mayors, our cities, our business leaders, and the community as a whole. Um, it's so important for us as the Peninsula community to hear from each of the mayors and to understand, in their words, their challenges, their priorities, and their vision, not only for their own city but for the peninsula as a whole because at the end of the day it's all through the collaboration among the cities the collaboration with the cities and our businesses and our residents that makes the peninsula such an incredible place um, and a wonderful community and we wanted the chamber wants to foster that collaboration and that partnership and this is a great step in that direction why is it important for the mayors to come out like this and talk about your city well, I think it's important because we need to know what's going on on the entire peninsula. We're really one community. I want to acknowledge our city manager, our Moranian, and our council members, Dave Bradley and Paul Sayo. They were kind enough to come along with me today. It's a wonderful, beautiful day, and we really do live in paradise. And when Eileen approached me about speaking, she said, about, oops, oh well, uh, uh, speak for about 15 minutes. And I said, 15 minutes? You know, what do you think I'm going to say for 15 minutes? But after hearing Jim, I can see that maybe, maybe I could do that. Um, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. And as um, this lovely lady mentioned, I was mayor during the 25th anniversary year. I don't really know how it happened, but it did. And 25 years later, here we are, still celebrating our city, which I believe is paradise, along with the other cities. And we're doing our best to make it and keep it that way. We have a problem with the landslide, if any of you take PV Drive South. Um, you know that. We have the largest l active landslide in North America in our city. So at the moment, we are trying to get funding to do some repairs that we would hope would l uh, slow it down. We have movement of about eight feet a year, if you can imagine. Some houses now are not even on the property that they started out on. And so we're trying to slow this down, but you know what a rainy season we had. And we're just waiting for the cracks to get bigger. So that's one of our major concerns, and we're hoping for quite a bit of funding. Water is the culprit. And if you can take water out of the landslide, you can really slow it down. The goal is not to completely stop it, but to really slow it down to minimal movement. Um, we have Ladera Linda Community Center. That's coming along, and if any of you are interested, you can go on the city's website and click on the button and see what's happening. Don't do it at night like I did because you can't see anything at night. <laughs> but um, it, we expect it to be done by September, and it's a little behind because of the rain, but not much. So um, that's coming along nicely. It's about a 6,700 square foot building, which is considerably smaller than the old buildings that it's replacing. And there's going to be a lawn area and um, equipment for the children. And, of course, just playgrounds and walking space. And also, we hope to put in some Japanese cherry trees in honor of our sister city in Japan, Sakura City. 
We're also working on a Civic Center Master Plan. As Jim said about PV Estates, the um, City Hall is old. You know, I hope they don't try and redo me since I'm old too. <laughs> but the Civic Center, it works, but there are barracks from World War II. And that's even older than I am, almost. And um, we have a committee that's working on it. Uh, we hope to have a plan soon, and we'll see what we can do in that respect. We have Western Avenue Commercial Corridor. That's partly in our city, and part of the time, you never know what city you're in, because RPV actually crosses Western Avenue and takes in some uh, parts on the eastern side, but we're working on beautification and really trying to incorporate it into our city. They, there are three projects that are intended to rebrand the corridor. Economic development, traffic flow, and beautification. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And we have um, wildfire cameras going in and those are going to watch over the entire peninsula, all four cities. The first one is going in today or tomorrow. And then there will be more um, next week. And then hopefully all four will be in by the time May ends. And these are looking for smoke. It's an early detection system that hopefully will help pre uh, preserve the peninsula. As you probably have noticed, the flowers and the weeds have sprung up because of the rain, and they will eventually dry out, and they will be a lot of fuel for possible fires. So we want to get these wildfire cameras installed. There will be four of them that uh, range across the peninsula and will detect any smoke from any of the four cities. And the fiscal year budget is coming up. We'll certify that in July. It's budget season. We've had lots of meetings, too many meetings, you know. Um, but Ara does a good job with fixing the budget up for us. It's over 33 million uh, before transfers out. So there is a structural surplus of over $5 million. And last but not least, I wanted to talk about the uh, 50th anniversary celebration. And I want everybody right now to put it on their calendars, September the 9th. That is going to be a grand gala at Terranea. And thank you, Ralph. Um, it's going to be quite the celebration and keep that on your calendar. Every month we've had some event, um, historic walks, scavenger hunts, and of course, whale of a day was wonderful. In fact, Ara even ordered up the best weather possible for that day. Um, next Saturday, we're having picnic at the Grove. And if you don't know, Ryan Park has trees that were planted in honor of the founders. And some of the founders were not even from RPV. Some were from Rolling Hills and some were from PV Estates. So our city really is a community project. And I like to think that the founders would be very proud of us at this point. The celebration is on September 9th. It'll be a black tie reception and it will all the information will be available on our website. And if you haven't checked out the RPV website, do so. It's really well done. And everything that you've ever wanted to know about RPV is on the website. So in closing, I would just, I promised Rob that it would be short and sweet. That was the first thing he said to me today. Not, hi, how are you? But it's going to be short, right? <laughs> So I'd like to um, 
invite all of you to come to our 50th anniversary celebration and celebrate with us because we really do live in paradise. Thank you. I think it's great bringing all four chamber cities together into this environment to talk about their goals, their accomplishments, and just put it out there for the PV community to see for themselves. We get to share a lot of information, and some of our issues are collaborative. Uh, fire detection cameras is a peninsula-wide um, concern, and we're working towards that. And uh, fire fuel maintenance, uh, you know, fire doesn't know any boundaries, so when we're discussing the public safety, it's important to have all the, the, uh, the mayors together to discuss that. As many of you know, Rolling Hills is a small city with a lot of equestrian flavor. We don't have those big city amenities like curbs and gutters and street lights and traffic lights or municipal storm drains with one exception I'll get to later. With a population of only about 1,800, we're one of the smallest cities in LA County. We're small but mighty and we have a very diverse population, most attracted to our rural atmosphere and laid back lifestyle. By the way, I think my colleagues covered almost everything I'm going to say, so I'll try to, I'll try to edit it as I go along here. We don't have a lot of excitement in Rolling Hills, but we do have a solid and effective city government. The most excitement we've had recently is that members of two world-famous rock bands moved into our city. We have no businesses in Rolling Hills, so you won't see any Rolling Hills addresses on the chamber membership list, but actually there's a lot going on in our city. To start, we have funded over $300,000 for fire fuel reduction in the Palos Verdes Land Conservancy, which abuts the southern border of Rolling Hills. You're welcome, Rancho Palos Verdes. <laughs> We're also seeking funding for an industrial mower to knock down the mustard before it drops its seeds. As beautiful as the mustard looks this time of year, it's one of the worst fire fuel sources on the hill. The Conservancy has done a great job of reducing the mustard and non-native acacia, which acts like a Roman candle when it burns. Thank you, Conservancy. We also have a very aggressive dead vegetation removal requirement within our city limits. Rolling Hills is characterized by wide open spaces, often heavily vegetated, which can support a lot of fire fuel if not maintained properly. As you may have read in the Daily Breeze, we've been contemplating an emergency siren system. We reached out to the other peninsula cities to gauge their interest in this process. This system, if implemented, would be used only as a last resort to inform the community of a disaster, only after all other methods of communication have failed. We have a very robust block captain system within our city. We have three lead co-captains in 24 zones, each one with one to three block captains. As a matter of fact, the block captains in the city just hosted an outdoor event at City Hall, along with our fire department, to allow them to explain to our residents the new defensible space requirements they will be enforcing when their inspection start on June 1st. Our city council is on the verge of approving our 2023-2024 budget, and I'm pleased to report that we anticipate a modest surplus. Our revenue is primarily based on property tax and building fees. We don't have a sales tax or transient occupancy tax revenue like our surrounding neighbors. As a result of these limitations, our staff aggressively goes after grant funding. Some of the grants we recently received have been used for the following. Utility undergrounding. This is at the top of our list for public safety, particularly fire safety. We will be undergrounding dozens of utility pools on our major streets, Crest Road and Eastfield Drive. We received a grant from FEMA for $3 million from their hazard mitigation grant program, and the City of Rolling Hills will match those funds with a million dollars of our own. And finally, we also received a million dollars in Edison Rule 28 funds from our county supervisor, Dan O'Connor. I would like to publicly thank the supervisor for this generous contribution for, without it, we would not be able to complete this project. We received another grant of a million dollars from FEMA for vegetation management, which will fund the required environmental clearance, as well as the actual work to remove fire fuel from 30 properties within the city that county fire has determined are most at risk. These properties are adjacent to the land conservancy. We received a local early action planning grant of $65,000. While modest in amount, I am delighted to report that this grant assisted us in successfully meeting the requirement of the State Housing and Community Development Department for certification of our affordable housing plan. This was a huge accomplishment and hats off to our staff because we actually had to meet compliance requirements for two cycles simultaneously and are now certified through 2029. Rolling Hills will also directly benefit 
from one and a half million dollars of state funding, Assembly Member Al at Sushi awarded to Rancho Palos Verdes. Again, thank you. This is for the installation of wildfire detection cameras for the entire peninsula. Another big win for our city was achieving an exemption from the Regional Board for Stormwater Monitoring. After submitting data which reflected water discharge from rolling hills only, it was determined that we are in compliance with state requirements and no longer have to submit stormwater capture requirements, which saves our small city a considerable amount of money. Some of the projects we anticipate in the near future are the remodeling of our outdated city hall, among the other cities on the hill as well, replacement of our emergency generator with solar and battery backup, and we're even studying a sewer system that would benefit about a third of our residents. With the support from Congress Member Ted Liu, he called for funding for our sewer project in federal appropriations bill, which we are waiting to pass to Congress. For a city without a municipal sewer system, this is a big deal. These projects will be funded by a combination of grants and reserve funds. While we have a comfortable reserve, we are also conscious that those funds must be replenished if we are to engage in future capital improvement projects. One subject I alluded to earlier is storm drains. Until recently, our staff and council didn't realize we actually owned the storm drain. When we went to the county and asked them to address the deteriorating drain, they promptly responded with a 50-year-old document identifying the city of Rolling Hills as the owner. Who knew? In any event, after much hammering, our city council finally voted to fund the relining, relining of the drain at a cost of $450,000. I know you bigger cities have projects size on a regular basis, but for a city with a budget of only two and a half million, it was a gut punch. Needless to say, we had to dig into our reserves for such a project. Even so, we remain substantially above our minimum reserve requirements. Looking forward, we have a unique opportunity to bring our residents together and provide them with a high quality of life environment through safety and community involvement. We have several organizations that support recreation and fellowship in our city. The Caballeros Club supports our equestrian trail and trail community and will be hosting an upcoming old-fashioned pancake breakfast. We have a mom and tots on the green, which is the city hall, hall campus. Our courts club supports our tennis and extremely popular pickleball community. We have a regular dinner on the green for seniors events, which always brings out a good turnout. Equestrian activities are still very popular in Rolling Hills. Last month, I participated in a five-hour ride through the city with about 40 other riders. It was quite the sight with that many horses and riders all out at one time. Sorry about the dust. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to recognize someone very special to Rolling Hills. As you now know, Elaine Jang, our city manager, will be leaving us and taking the same position at Palos Verdes Estates. Jim's gone, but he owes me big time for this one. <laughs> I served my first term as mayor five years ago. Coincidentally, that's when Elaine was hired. As a matter of fact, an event in this room uh, was her first, I guess, public event. I took her table to table and, and introduced her. Now, five years later, she's leaving us, and our council will have to hire another city manager. It seems like we only lose city managers during my term as mayor. <laughs> with no experience as city manager, our council decided to take a chance with her, and boy, did our gamble pay off. She's well-liked by our residents and staff, but more important, she is effective. All those grants I previously mentioned, each one has a lane stamp on it. She has revived our block program, block captain program, which had gone through gone dormant for a few years. She led us through our housing element with the state against impossible odds. She has dealt with staff turnover, and for a city with such a small full-time staff of six, even losing one staff member is a huge percentage. She guided us through COVID and upgraded all departments within our city. Even with our small population, she's promoted our city to elected officials and agencies to bring us recognition and services. She's the senior manager on the Hill, at least by, the time, of, by time of service, and has collaborated strategically with the other peninsula cities. While personally sad to see her leave, leaving Rolling Hills, I couldn't be happier than to see her embrace her next challenge and take all of her problem-solving skills with her. As, I meant, as mentioned, Elaine was hired during my first term as mayor. Now she's leaving my, during my second term. I hope our council is as blessed to find a replacement of her caliber as we were with her. I don't mean to poach, but listen up, you, city, you assistant city managers out there. I'm, I'm working the room. Rest assured, Elaine, that you are leaving the city in better condition than when you started. Thank you, Elaine.
And thank you to the Palace Breeze community, the Chamber, for the support our city has received from you. By the way, as a plug for the PB Street Fair coming up next month, my band will be playing on Sunday, June 11th at 2.30 p.m. <laughs> It's really exciting to have this opportunity to share uh, at the, at the uh, chamber meeting. I've been a long time uh, chamber member and it's always so much fun to see uh, friends and colleagues and neighbors here and to me that's one of the exciting things about being a local public servant because we actually get to uh, provide assistance for our, our, our local, the people that we live with, our neighbors and friends. So um, I just really appreciate this opportunity to be here this morning and to be able to give an update on our city. I would like to uh, uh, preface my comments by um, uh, speaking a little bit about uh, one of the issues that I get questions about all the time. Uh, people reading in the newspaper about what's going on at the state level and how that's impacting us as um, as a peninsula here. And um, I would just say as a small city, our city of Rolling Hills Estates has 8,000 residents. We um, traditionally, our city council has uh, been involved in regional organizations and try to be involved in leadership there in order to give our small city and the peninsula more of a voice in what goes on in, in our state. Um, we, even with the four cities, we have a total population of a little bit over 60,000, which in the bigger picture of California is considered a small city. So our, our biggest city is, is Rancho, uh, with a little over 41,000. PB Estates has a little over 13, we're eight, and Rolling Hills comes in at under 2,000. So um, we, we have felt uh, traditionally that it's so important for us <laughs> to be able to have more of a voice in what is going on. And, and basically, a trend that we're seeing at the, at the state legislature level is um, slowly uh, absorbing the local autonomy that we have as cities to make decisions about land use, uh, permitting, zoning, that sort of thing. And um, the, you know, this disturbing thing is, as you know, we have a, a major housing shortage. Um, is uh, we've, Each uh, city has been allotted a, a housing um, requirement that we need to come up with, and then legislation has been passed at the state level that uh, requires us to um, uh, allow multifamily uh, structures in the middle of residential areas and impacting our abilities to, to have residential zoning and so forth. What, um, I personally have made an effort to um, be involved in our South Bay region. I most recently served as president of the South Bay Council of Governments and they, they in turn elected me to the State California Council of Governments and uh, the um, State Board of uh, the League of California Cities. And one result of that has just uh, really made me aware of what an enormous difference there is between North and South in terms of our, our state outlook. And when you have larger cities like San Francisco, Sacramento, Berkeley, whose legislators feel that um, they should, the state should take uh, positions that impact us at the local level, um, uh, uh, eroding uh, the, the autonomy that we have as cities. So one of the strategies that, that we on the local level have, we have worked to put a ballot measure uh, um, and, and that would overturn some of this legislation, returning local control to our cities that uh, did not get enough signatures to be on the 24 uh, election, but we're working on 2026. So um, that's one of the many issues that we're, we're working on. And um, I do want to tell you more specifically some of the things that are happening in our city. One, of course, issue 
uh, that's uh, foremost for us is public safety. And um, we feel it's very important for us to look, work with our local businesses in terms of crime prevention. As you know, our Peninsula Center and our Promenade are part of our city, and we have uh, appreciated very much the partnership that we've had with, with businesses here. And as you know, we contract in our city with the um, LA County Sheriff's Department for our fire and crime prevention, and so we work very closely with the La uh, Lomita Sheriff's Station. Um, we have been very pleased with um, the low levels of crime uh, in our city and in the peninsula in general, um, although there was an increase over the holidays in retail theft and burglaries, but we work closely with the sheriff to increase our, our presence of uh, patrols up there and also the mounted posse with the sheriff. And so we are, we're pleased with the results of that. Uh, our city, Rolling Hills Estates, also works closely with the other three cities in cooperating with, uh, we have a regional contract law uh, meeting monthly where we meet with the sheriff and the cities to review the statistics and uh, address any problem areas. And we also have a public safety committee that meets regularly. And then we have completed the automated license plate reader camera system, known as ALPERS, which detects stolen vehicles. And uh, they are now, have now been installed at all the entrances to the peninsula and have been very, very effective in uh, catching a lot of uh, perpetrators. Uh, we're also very active in emergency preparedness. Our four cities have just launched a platform called Know Your Zone, and this is an evacuation tool that is operated by first responders. And we have a web page set up, pvready.org, where people can go on uh, the website and determine uh, where their zone is so that uh, they can be prepared in the case of, of an emergency where evacuation is, is necessary. Uh, we also have our part participate in Alert South Bay, where um, there, which is a mass emergency notification system. Many of you have already uh, tied in with that. Uh, keeps you informed on traffic impacts, emergencies, public safety, and so forth. Um, we also have uh, some current city projects going on, which are infrastructure improvements. One of them is uh, the street paving project in the commercial district along Silver Spur Road. And we've, been do we've done this in partnership with Rancho Palos Verdes. This uh, project was delayed due to the, the rain. Of course, we needed the rain, so we're happy with that. But uh, it took a little longer, but that is complete. And so thank you for your patience on that. Um, we also recently completed the local roadway safety plan to identify, analyze, and prioritize roadway safety improvements. And um, pedestrian improvements on Deep Valley Drive were specifically included in the plan and um, in terms of upgrading pedestrian crossings uh, to improve safety of also cyclists and motorcycles. Um, some of most of you who come in through the uh, east side of the city, there off of Western, have noticed that the large metropolitan water district pipe relining projects is um, many times in the morning. Uh, we have a little bit of a backup there. We'll say a little bit, um, and that's by the Palos Verdes Reservoir. But that a project. Uh, has very successfully uh, kept on schedule and is uh, uh, scheduled to be completed uh, by June. And um, uh, we then, on that corner, there's um, a, going to be a new park in the vicinity there, uh, and we're naming it Founders Park in recognition of the city founders of the first city council. And uh, so we're looking forward to beautifying that that corner, we, that we've had that property, but it has been used by the various water projects um, over the last few years. And so, um, but we're also very excited on the opposite corner, which is where Georgia Canyon Nature Preserve is, and um, 
um, I know many of you do hiking there, wonderful hiking trails, and um, there is a little bungalow on the corner there. Some people call it a shack, we call it a bungalow. And that has been there since, uh, you know, the beginning of uh, when that land was donated. And uh, so we are undertaking a major um, remodel of that, and it will be a, a beautiful entry to the city. So um, we um, received a, a um, from the California Department of Parks and Recreation, 1.2 million in support of that, and that was made possible by our state senator, Ben Allen. And so we have been just um, very excited about that project, which is going to be getting underway. In fact, we um, invited uh, Congressman Ted Lieu last week to come and look at that with the hope that we might get some federal funding for that also. Uh, we also have been uh, moving ahead with EV charging stations, and we now have 12 electric vehicle charging uh, ports at our city hall, and this was paid for by Southern California Edison Charge Ready programs. And um, businesses can also apply for this program through, through Edison. So um, we're excited about the, the growth of these charging stations around the city. We also have been working in the area of waste and recycling. As most of you are aware, the state of California now requires all businesses to separate food and yard waste from trash and recycle in separate organic waste carts. So if you, if you need assistance in this, you feel free to call our staff uh, at our city hall and we will help coordinate with waste management on this. Um, in addition, the state is, uh, also has a mandatory recycling program, and uh, to help our businesses, we've developed a commercial recycling hero program. So uh, every, uh, um, every quarter we have a drawing where, uh, where uh, businesses can be recognized for doing a good job. We're also on the cutting edge for solar. Um, the city has made it easier than ever to add solar to homes in Rolling Hills Estates, and we're the first city in L.A. County to launch an online instant permitting program, which is called Solar App Plus. And uh, so licensed contractors and installers can fill out a detailed questionnaire, code compliance is checked automatically, and the permit is paid for and issued instantly. So. Um, we are, are pleased with the progress made on that. We do have a couple of community development projects that you probably have been watching going up uh, the top of the hill. We have a 75 unit condominium project at 927 Deep Valley Drive, and this is anticipated to be completed by the end of the year. Uh, another ongoing project up there that you've probably seen in progress is the Peninsula Point Assisted Living and Memory Care Facility. And that is also close to completion and will be open this summer. Well, I will close with just a couple, a few, not a couple, but a few uh, exciting events that are coming up that there, our city is hosting. Uh, the one is this weekend, and it's the um, famous Mayor's Ride uh, that starts at 8.30 in the morning at City Hall. And you can bring your horse and join us. We do a 45-minute ride through uh, the trails. We have 25 miles of beautiful trails throughout our city, and so we like to show those off. And uh, so once a year, we, we host this ride and then end up at Ernie Howlett, where the scouts are doing their um, fundraising pancake breakfast. So even if you, uh, you know, your horse is uh, in the garage or whatever, you, you could just come to Ernie Howlett and have pancakes with us. And so pancakes are, uh, start uh, serving at uh, 7 in the morning. It goes until noon. We are also on May 20 having kids in the park, uh, kids to the park day. And that's the day where we're encouraging families to come and just enjoy uh, one of our many parks in the city. We're also going to be having summer, summer movie nights. We're having a Hills Are Alive 5 and 10K race, and that's in August. 
Uh, we have a concert in the park, uh, August 19. Uh, another really special event that we are hosting this year on um, August Saturday, August 26, is a recognition of the centennial of the 19th Amendment of the, uh, giving women the vote. And so we will be unveiling a plaque and having a, um, a special uh, celebration at City Hall uh, and inviting all of the peninsula in the South Bay and also working with um, uh, the League of California Cities and the, the library and schools to try to have other events, educational events, before uh, the August 26th unveiling. And uh, so that's the centennial celebration. Uh, then we have an annual event called the City Celebration, which is going to be Saturday, September 23, in the Empty Saddle Club. And this is celebrating our 66th uh, city birthday. Uh, then in October, we also have Prepared Peninsula Expo and uh, a Tracy Austin Doubles tournament, tournament, Tennis Tournament. And then we wrap up the year with our annual holiday parade of lights, which is always the first Saturday of December. So that'll be Saturday, December 2. So most of these events have an opportunity for your biz business to sponsor and be a partner with us. So we hope that um, you will join us for some of these events. And um, as I started out, we're very excited to work with our other peninsula cities. We, uh, the mayors get together for lunch once a, a month to just stay uh, open lines of communication, what's happening in our cities. So um, we, uh, we agree we live in a beautiful place. And thank you for the opportunity to share. I'll just say that, first of all, personally, I love doing this stuff and meeting everyone in the community. Uh, we have a very important message for people who uh, live and work in Palos Verdes Estates. Um, and it's really about making sure that we have the funding that we need in the future to keep our city viable. Uh, I think um, most folks in our community are aware uh, that a quarter of the city's budget comes from Measure D. And part of my message to folks today will be about making sure that everyone understands that we have to remain committed to renewing and increasing that as expenses increase um, so that we can maintain the beautiful city that we have and, um, and continue to self-govern. So it's one, one hill, one peninsula, the four mayors, uh, we, have, we meet very regularly. Um, we have a, a regular lunch every month and we're constantly uh, talking to each other and I think it's just important to maintain relationships with neighbors. We share borders with two other cities. We need to make sure that um, you know we're, we're acting as good neighbors and, and uh, working together. The uh, you know I have a message that I've been um, speaking to many different groups uh, in Palos Verdes Estates. Um, and the same message I'm going to share with you today about what it's going to take to sort of move our city forward. But, uh, and I really appreciate your, your uh, time this morning. I need to apologize in advance uh, because I won't be here at the time that uh, your, your, uh, the rest of the mayors here will be taking questions because I have another engagement right after this. So apologies for that. But if you have any questions for me, you're welcome to reach out to me at the city, my city email, and I'll be happy to respond to you. Um, I, uh, first thing I wanted to mention, very important, and, and probably I said last night uh, at a city council meeting that we had, I think probably the most important thing that we will do all year uh, is hire a new city manager, uh, our city manager, um, who uh, he left uh, in February to uh, pursue another opportunity. And we were very lucky to have Elaine Zhang, who is the current city, was just introduced. <laughs> was just introduced as the city manager of Rolling Hills um, step up and say she was ready to take on uh, the challenge of Palos Verdes Estates and we are very honored to have her uh, joining the team and uh, look forward to uh, all the contributions she's going to make. Um, most, most important job uh, in the city and uh, we couldn't have, couldn't have asked for a better, better person. So very excited about that. Thank you, Elaine. Um, next up, I wanted to mention, I think m many of you may be aware that this is uh, the 100th anniversary, sort of, of the founding of the Palos Verdes Project. Um, and 
if you're not familiar with what exactly the Palos Verdes Project was, uh, it really was the foundation of what became the city of Palos Verdes Estates. The Palos Verdes Project was a uh, real estate development um, that was uh, begun by, uh, um, excuse me, I'm blanking, but uh, suffice to say, uh, it, you know, it, is, it established really the character of our city uh, and became the foundation of what eventually became the city in 1939 when the city was incorporated. And we're really excited to, be, to partner with um, the uh, library district on their Doors Open Peninsula event, which will take place in June uh, and features, um, features stops uh, throughout the entire peninsula. And the city, in, in coordination with the Palos Verdes Estates Foundation, is also very excited to be hosting a benefit concert uh, in August, um, which we hope all of you will uh, be able to attend. Uh, the entertainment for it is still being planned, but we expect it'll be a fantastic event uh, and will raise a lot of money um, to support uh, public safety. Um, so looking forward to that. The, um, uh, I want to talk about some of the accomplishments that the City Council has made in the last year. Um, one that probably is, is kind of close to home here. I don't know how many of you were watching some, some of the drama around La Venta. Um, I had the opportunity to see Meg this morning. I'm sure she's <laughs> breathing a sigh of relief um, about our having moved past that issue. Um, I'm really pleased to say I think we've, we've you know, Meg is committed to some uh, improvements, some, some operational changes that will uh, benefit some of the neighbors. Um, but I think uh, the City Council demonstrated its commitment to make sure that the city is open for business and that La Venta continues to be successful in its location. We're very grateful to have Meg um, uh, you know, operating that uh, in our city. Um, we also, in the last year, uh, made a lot of progress uh, sort of fiscally. Um, we established a pension funding policy for, for the first time in the city's history. Um, we established policies uh, for a general fund surplus and one-time revenue. Uh, we hired an outstanding public works director and a management analyst. And we also uh, made enormous progress in rebuilding the city's police department, which had been hit by an enormous amount of turnover in the wake of some of the, the debate about whether or not we would maintain our own police department. Uh, and I'm really happy to say that that, that the department is now substantially built out. And um, you know the, the pressure uh, and overtime demands on the police department are you know much relieved. And uh, I think that that leads to a higher level of public safety for all of our residents. Um, the, uh, the message that I wanted to give to folks and that, that I've been speaking to uh, is really about what it takes for us to continue to have a city. Um, I became interested in municipal government and in the city of Palos Verdes Estates in particular when, uh, shortly after I moved to the city, uh, a ballot initiative to pass parcel tax failed. And if you, those of you who don't remember, that, that, is, that was Measure D. Measure D was um, billed at the time um, as funding our fire department, which is in contract with the County of Los Angeles. Um, that contract costs us about $7 million a year. Uh, and Measure D, at the time, it cost us slightly less than $5 million a year. Uh, and Measure D was intended to cover that expense. It is some form of this parcel tax has been on the books in Palos Verdes Estates for uh, like 30 years, and it has been regularly renewed, usually with over 80% of the support of uh, residents. Um, a ballot initiative like this requires a two-thirds vote, uh, and it narrowly was defeated, Measure D, and the city lost funding, you know, lost about $5 million worth of revenue uh, at that time. This, uh, this began, a, this required the city council to take a lot of, of um, drastic measures that, although we, we eventually were able to pass another parcel tax, uh, we really haven't even recovered from. Um, cuts to uh, what we're doing on tree trimming, cuts on landscape maintenance, cuts on you know any of the other, any number of services that people uh, rely on from their city. And I think some of that is still felt today. Uh, we, the following year, the council at the time did manage to get past a replacement measure, which was Measure E, uh, and that remains on the books today. But uh, the compromise in Measure E, which was nearly identical to Measure D in every single way, uh, was that it doesn't have an inflator, which perhaps at the time didn't seem like that big a deal, but um, obviously in an inflationary environment is, is a challenge for the city. Um, the, uh, you know, to, to give you an idea of um, 
try to understand, yeah, I, Measure E was, was billed as something that was for the police department, but the reality is it wasn't, it's not really for the police department. The, the money is, is uh, earmarked for the police department, but ultimately Measure E is required in order for us to have a city. And uh, the, if you look at the fire, our contract with the fire department, they do a fantastic job, but they have 15 employees, uh, and we pay about $7 million, we will, next fiscal year for that. Uh, by comparison, our police department, which is about 30 FTEs, um, is about the same price. So, uh, you know, it's been argued that it would, it had been argued that we should have considered, you know, cheaper services through the county for the, um, for uh, the sheriff. I think if we wanted the same level of service that we were used to in Bells Ridges Estates, we definitely would have been looking at uh, ever escalating costs that we did not have control over in a way that we do when we have our own department. And the lack of an inflator in Measure E means that this, what is supposed to be a quarter of the city's budget is, you know, it's shrinking relative to the rest of our revenue every single year. And when we eventually come back, residents are, I, my concern personally as mayor, you know, is that residents will be shocked by the, by the difference in what we need to ask for. Um, so it's our goal, my personal goal, that we do something about that sooner rather than later and hopefully address it uh, perhaps as early as um, 2024 uh, with a replacement uh, for Measure E. Um, last thing I want to just cover real quick, um, because there's some talk about, you, you, pr you may have heard um, people refer to the AECOM study. Um, it's really a study being conducted by the Palos Verdes Estates Foundation. They're taking a look at uh, the city hall and what, you know, what potential options there are for redeveloping that. Um, rebuilding a city hall and having it just be a city hall is a very expensive proposition that would cost taxpayers quite a bit of money. But there's potentially opportunities for there to be, you know, a, a facility that perhaps had retail on a lower floor and, and had um, office space above, uh, in addition to um, facilities for the police department and fire departments. Um, and that, that could be done in a manner that would be less costly to taxpayers. I want to encourage folks to support that initiative. Uh, the, our, our city hall really is in very bad condition. Uh, there's a group that sent out a photo of it last week and they referred to it as PVE's iconic city hall and they have a very lovely picture of it from Palos Verdes Drive West. I can assure you it doesn't look like that. If you're on the other side of the building, you can see that the roof is barely there. Um, you cannot fit a fire truck in that building, or at least you can't fit a modern fire truck uh, in that building. Um, there are serious uh, uh, deficiencies uh, in the space that we have for the fire department. They, they, only have, um, they only have one locker room, even though men and women both serve in the department. Um, they, uh, can, they have no space to, for any number of equipment that they need. Uh, the police department similarly is laid out like a maze. Um, we currently have a, a study going on with an engineering firm looking at s structural cracking and uh, water intrusion that we have in the garage. Uh, the entire building is unsafe and not earthquake safe, and the greatest risk is that um, a, a, uh, you know, if there was a major earthquake event, uh, we could uh, end up with our first responders being impacted at exactly the time that we need them. So I think it's very important that we take that issue seriously. Um, there are, there's definitely a campaign to try to convince people that the existing city hall is something worth preserving. Um, and I'm not, I, I'll encourage you to uh, view that with skepticism. Uh, that's everything I've got. I apologize again that I won't be able to stay for your questions, but please email me. My email address is jroos at pvestates.org. And I'll be happy to, to answer any of your questions. And enjoy the rest of your breakfast. Thank you so much. And that will do it for today's show. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Maria Soreo, and we'll see you around the peninsula.